Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strong. On this week's episode, I speak with Dr. Raber, that's PhD chemist Jeff Raber, about terpenes. I wanted to talk to you today about terpenes because I know this is really an area where you are an expert. And the thing that really fascinates me about terpenes is that terpenes are legal. Mm -hmm. So cannabinoids are heavily regulated, but the other important phytochemical in the plant, the terpenes are not regulated. So I think we have some leeway here to lean on more research in in the world of terpenes Mm -hmm. to talk openly and safely about the medicinal properties of them. And I think a lot of people don't even know what terpenes are. So I kind of want to cover the basics because there's nobody better to do that than, than okay. have Dr. Dr. Raber on. And I know you, I know you've talked so much about this, but I'm hoping you can at least kind of give like a basic overview of what terpenes are, why they're important to cannabis. And then we can kind of dive into some sure. kind of deeper sure. dialogue around yep. that. I mean, they're common to almost all plants, fruits, vegetables, and things of that type. So the word terpene to a chemist means isoprene units and building blocks of carbon, certain types of building blocks that are used to create these molecules. And they can be relatively simple and exceptionally complex. So um, a more famous terpene might be known as taxol. It was found on the Pacific yew tree. It's a strong anti-cancer agent, and it is amazingly complex in its chemical structure. The ones we find in cannabis are nowhere near that type of complexity. Um, Some of them are simple hydrocarbons. Some of them then get oxygenated. There's also some, uh, you know, other pieces that get added that then affect their properties from an olfactory standpoint and from a physiological impact standpoint. So, and I think these molecules are made by the plants more so to have the plants communicate with their environment and talk Mm -hmm. to the rest of their world. You have a poor little defenseless, you know, being basically that sits there. It can't run away from anyone trying to attack it. It doesn't know how to call for help vocally like we do. So it sends out molecules to, you know, either ward off folks or attract the right ones to take care of the current problem that's on them. Um, One of my favorite documentaries is what plants talk about. And it Mm. really kind of talks a little bit about this, you know, communication, if you will. And we're probably trying to be like chemical translators, like understand the language of the plants and understand how that impacts our body's chemical language, biochemical language, and our physiology, and how might we understand which ones are present and how that would relate to our, you know, enjoying, liking, or need for what's there as long as we're getting it in a certain form. Um, so in a general sense, these are the, the molecules that smell. We call that volatile, the ones that are able to leave the plant a, a lot easier. Cannabinoids, you cannot smell from the plant. Whenever you put your, your face to the cannabis plant and try and notice what you're recognizing, it is um, terpenes that you're smelling and other volatile-like compounds like that. So you know, I think colloquially, we use the term very, very broadly in cannabis to say all the things that generate smell. Uh, chemically, technically, they're not all technical terpenes. There are other molecules that would not be designated as terpenes. But I think we'll just proceed with like all these things that impact with smell and then taste, and then also are knowing now to cause impacts for physiological effect and feel, we call, generally speaking, terpenes. Um, Terpenes, terpenoids, you know, aldehydes, ketones, esters, there's all sorts of other funky chemical names we can give them. But for the sake of conversation and to keep it easy on everybody, because not everybody liked chemistry like I did, (laughs) um, we'll go ahead and just call them terpenes. But each of the cannabis cultivars, you know, there are about 120 or so different terpenes known to cannabis. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there are tens and tens of thousands of these molecules known on on the planet in the botanical world. So, you know, there's a very small subset of them that are present in cannabis. And a lot of these things are not only found in cannabis. There are very, very few that are specific to cannabis as we know today. We haven't looked at every plant on the planet, so you can't rule out the possibility that you find some of these other ones elsewhere. Um, but there are ones that are very common, like limonene is found in, you know, citrus. So the orange juice industry, you know, limes, lemons, they have tons of those things. Um, linalool is another popular one that you find that's present in lavender. So we might understand, hey, lavender that's been standardized as an extract can have very good utility um, for 
kind of relaxation and anti-anxiety. So might we be able to extrapolate that if there's some linalool in this cannabis plant, it's doing that? I think that's a very risky extrapolation because there could be, you know, five other terpenes on the other side that are going to exacerbate the problem and not allow linalool to do what it does. Um, we have to think of it in specific compositional terms. And that's where I think it gets even more complicated. So these plants make the molecules to talk to their environment, to talk to each other, to ward off pests or attract, you know, things that could help them from the pests. And we're here looking at them saying, this is pleasing to me, smells good to me, this will impact my taste. Um, and ultimately, we believe that this is a big part of that ensemble or entourage effect that is driving the physiological utility of cannabis, right? We think of it, you know, cannabinoids have a large part of that, but one cannabinoid by itself is not nearly as effective as adding all the other molecules, predominantly terpenes. If it was, we would all have Marinol and be satisfied with that. Um, and that definitely isn't the case for a lot of physiological ailments. It also doesn't open up the plethora of products that we see. Um, you know, while you were saying you can't regulate plants that well, I mean, I don't know if everyone's going to be in their home making some of these sophisticated products, or, you know, I wouldn't go through the whole process of making a single vape cart from the entire plant that I had. Right. So there are other benefits to, you know, regulating, educating, taxing, and making sure this supply chain um, for consumers is really, you know, well checked and free of impurities and stuff like that. Um, and I think terpenes are a, a huge part of the cannabis space, but as you mentioned, they are, they're not regulated yet. That's coming though. <laughs> um, there are some states starting to kind of regulate what of these types of molecules and are these ingredients going into inhalable products? Because we saw if you don't watch some of that closely, people might not use a terpene, but they might use something else to put inside of a vape cart and cause the Avali problem that we saw at the end of 2019. Right. I, I want to, cause I know, I know you're an experienced manufacturer and I wanted to talk to you about vape pens a little bit and kind of safety levels with terpenes, but just to kind of back up. So sure. I really like the way you put this cause I've never really he heard it put this exact way, but it sounds like basically you're saying terpenes are the language of plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it is how yeah. they are communicating with their environment because they are a rooted uh, yeah. Bean. Yeah, yeah. They're, the DNA of plants is, from what I understand, more complex than humans. They're actually a very intelligent life yeah. form. They have networks. They talk to each other. There, yeah. There's all sorts of you know community interplay going on. It, it's um, unbelievable. I mean, it's 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 really psychedelic when you break it down. But I really like like diving into this. I mean, science is psychedelic, especially chemistry. Yeah. Yep. There's no other way to, to think about it. And a lot of facets to it, for sure. But just so people kind of understand the basics, when, when we're talking about terpenes, like if you take an orange and you scratch an orange peel and you, you're going to get a really vibrant smell, are those are terpenes that you're smelling yes. from that orange? Yes, predominantly terpenes. And most of the essential oil from the orange peel is limonene. So okay. you're pre predominantly getting that, but it takes very, very, very little of any molecules, certain ones can be exceptionally small amounts to impact the olfactory sensory system. So even, you know, even to the extent where good analytical equipment can't detect them and you need really sophisticated, great stuff to start to get that hint and then be like, okay, I gotta, you know, figure out how to go after that. Um, our noses are exceptionally sensitive. Um, much more so than the equipment that we use in the lab all the time. Mm. So a little, you know, you might be able to measure 95% of this is limonene, but that smells slightly different um, because of the other 5% than just pure limonene. Hmm. Interesting. Do you have an opinion on, because I know in the cannabis industry, terpenes are a really big deal to cannabis manufacturers and to, and to consumers, whether they know what they are in the, in the right. chemistry of it or not. Yeah. We, Consumers typically buy cannabis flour with their nose. Mm -hmm. That's why in the old days you go in, you'd get the, you know, you get the mason jar, you right. crack it open, you yeah. smell it, and you're like, yeah, I want that one. Yep. Now it's a little different with the regulations. regulations. Made that can't, a little harder. <laughs> can't do that. So now people yeah. shop by THC percentages and other kind of yep. things that are on the label, or they just kind of know that well, OG Kush has the, the the effect and the smell that I like, so I'm I'm gonna go down yep. that path. I think it's interesting, like. You know, you're talking about how these terpenes, you know, they attract certain insects and repel others for their own protection. And a lot of the terpenes that I'm familiar with, like, like one of the most popular smells in cannabis is that gas smell, that mm -hmm. diesel, petrol, you know, that's OG Kush. That's the classic 
like strong, you know, when people talk about fire, they're usually right. talking about that jet fuel gas smell. Yep. And in nature, that's one of the, like the most offensive smells that a plant puts out to repel pests from what I understand. Yeah. yeah. But yet people seem to be really attracted right. to the, <laughs> right. to the funky, skunky, gassy smells. So I, I wonder like, you know, do you think that cannabis is, is aware of humans? And this is maybe getting a little bit, uh, esoteric there's, but there's a really interesting one called the botany of desire i don't know mm-hmm. if you've ever heard that's of that, kind of right? what i'm Where thinking of when yeah, i'm it's talking like, about this did did we evolve with cannabis or did cannabis you know influence our evolution with it which way is that interplay and crosstalk kind of going i mean we had we there are a lot of species with uh, conserved endocannabinoid systems for quite some time um so you might say well was the plant around and that's how i developed this system but i i built up my own network of molecules but now i can kind of harness it back in there if i'm depleted for a variety of reasons how does that cycle kind of continue over you know millions of years because that's it, it, a hard it, question <laughs> it is and I, I mean i don't know if we'll, we'll ever have the answer until we can actually understand the language of plants and literally communicate with them and, and maybe they'll tell us yeah, but yeah. i don't i don't yes, know when them directly They're like yes i've been playing with you guys for a long time thank <laughs> Thanks for thanks for keeping me around. Yeah, I was worried playing. that I was going to be eradicated, uh-huh. but you know, I heard your plans, and I said, no, 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 got to come up with something better. I um, mean, it, it sounds like stoner theories, like something you had come up with with your friends smoking a joint, but there's real science to back this up, um, and it doesn't probably sure. get explored enough. And I just think it's fascinating that plants produce all of these chemicals that don't necessarily like we're not really sure why they're doing it. i mean the cannabis plant is producing a, a wide variety of of well maybe simple chemical structure but still it doesn't necessarily seem to be in its direct advantage to produce all of these chemicals it seems like it'd be a little well, better off saving does, some energy everything it does costs its energy right i mean it's always coming at some sort of price or expense to whatever else it can do should i you know harvest light and turn that into some other molecule that i'm using to grow my stalks or should i use it to create a cannabinoid or a terpene because i need to protect myself i mean there's a real delicate system of balance there and i think you can see like different cultivars in different environments produce different profiles of cannabinoids and and terpenes because they're adapting to their environment right so there is an interplay there with what's around them so you know why did it produce this this profile well maybe it's low in pining because it was next to a pine forest and it's like well i don't need to put that one out there so much because Mm. you know that one's already around and i don't have that pest problem that this one was warding off um you know i think those those questions are so complex. I don't know if you really know the answer. We can sit here and theorize probably for right. days, um, knowing's a different story. But you do see different chemical profiles based on environmental expression, based on what else might be around it, and how it's trying to find its own balance with you know its own environment. And I think hmm. if there's anything we can probably assess that we you know makes reasonable sense, it's not doing something to produce these molecules because it just feels like doing it it has some sort of purpose from its perspective um because it would be a waste of energy to do so and i think they're they've just evolved for too long to really be that wasteful yeah the, this plant w- wouldn't have lasted the millions of years it's lasted on this planet by being wasteful with its energy yeah. production <laughs> right. which i which i think gives some credence to the botany of desire thesis which is that the plant is actually producing chemicals to some extent to please us because it knows we're taking care of it but that yeah. We may never know the answer to that question, but it's, it's for a those that are very curious, one. like go after John McPartland's work. He's done like DNA mm. barcoding and really mm. seeking, you know, when did cannabis evolve? Where did it go from starting in its origination and how did it proliferate across the, the globe? Um, real fascinating type of work and, and really mm. kind of interesting. I, I'm definitely going to check that. I've never heard of that. I'm definitely going to check that out. And so somebody that's that's run laboratories, cannabis testing laboratories, for years. Can you talk a little bit about how important this is for the advancement of the cannabis industry to have good, accurate lab testing? Yeah, it's it's a paramount importance, right? If you don't know what you have, you're never destined to repeat having the same thing. For those that are using it as medicine, it's very important to say, here's what I produced last time, and my next batch is the same, and the next one is the same. And you know what defines the same? Um, is it the same amount of THC, but yet my terpene profile was wildly different? I think we have enough experience from folks now that even if I called it the same name, but its chemical profile is different, I got different effects. 
um, even though I consumed exactly the same amount the same way. So something else was going on there. So if a lab can't discern those differences or can't start to you know, highlight or tell you, hey, these profiles were a little different than the one before, then we're never gonna be able to advance our understanding of which ones are right for which individuals at which times, or that we've got a good consistent process of saying this is being produced the same every single harvest. Um, and I think it won't it won't allow us to advance our knowledge base or our, our use and utility of the plant and with the plant um, if we don't have good accurate analytical. So it's really a linchpin and fundamental keystone to the whole you know picture in my mind. Yeah, and I, I know as a cannabis product manufacturer myself the. the not all labs are created equally. <laughs> no, 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 unfortunately. And I think, you know, if you're looking for like one molecule, say something like aspirin in a tablet, like we have lots and lots of rigorous science that's gone to saying this procedure will get you the accurate results for that. And it's not in a complicated matrix, right? I've got a couple of things in the tablets that are excipients. I've got this one active ingredient that's, you know, easy to find. I'm not looking for a hundred things. Right? I'm not even looking for 10 things, right? So if I say, look at this one in a simple matrix, that's pretty easy. If I start to say, look for these 10 in varying matrices and all sorts of different product types, that gets a lot harder. And I think, you know, it may be easy to say like the pesticide problem, right? When we say, hey, go look for 65 pesticides or a hundred different pesticides in all these cannabis products. You're like, well, one, I have to look for a hundred things. That's really hard in and of itself. Two, every type of product is different. Even every cultivar is somewhat different. Does my equipment that I've tuned for one work for the other? So if I can find it in, you know, say a simple extract because I've taken out a bunch of the plant matrix, does that extrapolate well to the entire raw plant? And how would that translate to a gummy bear or a brownie matrix? Um, from a technical standpoint in the laboratory, that's super challenging. Just to be sure that you're getting that right across the plethora of products that we see in cannabis is a huge, huge effort. Yeah, I, I empathize with 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 the labs to a large extent, and you know, and I've I've been I've been using labs, and you know, I used the workshop back in the day when 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 you guys were around because yeah. because I knew I was growing my own cannabis. I knew my plants really well. I knew their terpene profiles generally. I generally knew what I was going to get when I would do my infusions. And I'd, you know, send those samples out to different labs. And sometimes I'd get crazy data back, you know, <laughs> just stuff that made no sense at all. Unfortunately, you know? right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. And and then um, and then I'd find labs where I was like, okay, yeah, I'm getting pretty consistent R and D reports. And I know I can trust. That yep. at least this is within probably a very small margin of error, an accurate lab test result. And then as someone that, you know, has always, you know, in the Prop 215 days, I had my collective and I was giving products to cancer patients mm -hmm. and, and people with compromised immune systems. And I, and I wanted to know for sure that what I was giving them was, was accurately tested, that it, that it did not have pesticides in it, that it did not have heavy metals. No one was testing for this stuff back then. I mean, very, very few people mm -hmm. We're going to the lengths of terpene testing. Give me a break. I mean, who was doing <laughs> terpene testing 10 years ago? I, mean, I, don't, yeah. I don't even, did the standards even we exist? We started they in must 2011. Have. So, I mean, the standards were there, but, you know, tuning them to kind of look through cannabis and start doing that. Um, yeah, it became apparent to us after about a year of operating, you're like, this, this is not just THC and CBD. Like, there's right. no way that is all this is about. How do we make that next step into at least starting to scratch the surface on, on terpenes? And it's so complicated. Um, it's just a complicated analytical problem in its own right, but to then kind of, you know, make the endeavor into cannabis and seeing the whole world of complexity it has to offer, it's, uh, it, there's a lot there, unfortunately. And you were right to point that, you know, labs have a, a, a window of accuracy, right? I will never give you the same number to two or three decimal points on everything. And if I do, I'm probably copying and pasting. Right. So you should probably run from that lab. That's not right. I strongly feel it's it's almost better and perhaps even safer to have no info than the wrong or bad info. Yep. So I have a false sense of, uh, you know, I got something or it was inaccurately told to me that I had this in my hand. I approach that differently than if I don't really know it's here and maybe I give it a little bit more caution. Um, you know, someone says, hey, you only have 10 milligrams in there, but they did the math wrong and it was 100. You're going to say, oh, 10. All right. 
Now, if I go like, I don't know what's in here, be careful, start slow and, you know, go with a fraction of it, you wouldn't consume the whole thing. So there's, you know, I think an inaccurate lab can cause a lot more harm than no lab. Right. And, you know, we really still don't see great lab standardization across the board. We don't have a single method to point to for every product or even, you know, simple products. We don't have um, every state kind of approaching that in the same way. I think there are there is some things in the works that is uh, definitely are going to see that get a lot better in the near future. So that's coming, but it's not a great level lab playing field yet today, unfortunately. And the consumers right. and the operators all kind of suffer alike from that one. Definitely. And, you, you know, I, the reason what I was kind of hinting at with, with the question for the industry as a whole, I think the lab having good lab test results is essential for the advancement of the industry because I think what will what will derail cannabis ultimately is bad lab testing. You know, if, if somebody goes to a legal dispensary and buys a product that says it has 10 milligrams of THC and it turns out that it has 4,000 or, or, you know, or something that really messes them up and, and you know, they wouldn't overdose on it, but they could get into a car crash. I mean, yeah, something yeah. really bad could happen yeah. because of you a bad lab test. Event. Yeah. And, you know, and, and in California, it's, it's been, it's been a mess. And I've always wondered, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on should, should the states have a lab? Yeah, I do think they need to be a reference lab. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of being able to take these products and ship them across the country so that we could have, you know, 10 other labs and 10 geographies that may not be competing directly with each local market, check each other and check themselves. Um, you know, I think the state needs to run a state reference lab and running one will kind of allow it to say, hey, look, here's the benchmark. You at least I'll have to do this. We know from a technical standpoint, these methods that they've been using, you know, have worked. So the other labs can adopt those or if they feel they're too slow or non-economical, they can validate against it. So I can say I ran this one from the state lab and I got the results right. I made my new way and it's faster, cheaper, so I can offer better competitive pricing. But I know I can get the same results that that state lab gets great then we're in a good spot because the state's going to tell you you have to be able to at least do this and kind of set you know more of a let's say operational and provable benchmark than just saying go find these things at this level um where someone's like but i didn't calibrate my stuff right and i can tell you i was at this level or i can fudge these you know procedures in certain ways to think that i got a result but I'll give you a 45% flower result if that's what right. you really need. Um, you know, some of that stuff is, I, I think we laugh, but it's really harmful, especially sure. to someone that's looking for dosing or to some operator that's like, I'm trying to figure this out the right way for a brand that's going to last for eternity, hopefully. Right. And I can't compete against those gaming the system that are, you know, just trying to get a higher number for a higher sale price today, but don't really care if they trash their brand reputation. Right. It's not, it's not really a, a fair level playing field. I don't think it's really uh, no, and not I, good to the honest operator. No. And I, th I think you're right. The only way to really to level that playing field and to maintain some consistency is to have a, a state run lab that right i mean a they reference get tax lab revenue, right they <laughs> but get they're not they're in the them, game yeah. to say like i'm gonna push a number higher or i'm gonna purposely try to like you know not do so well on my you know right um fill in your blank now I, I don't want the government involved in any other aspect of the business i don't want the government growing the flour i don't want them right. manufacturing the products i don't no. want them selling the products like they do no. in canada i don't want any of that but i think they should be involved in laboratory testing and probably what needs to happen is every state will have its own lab and then at the federal level there'll be a federal lab run by the mm -hmm. fda i would imagine yeah. they would then oversee all those state labs that would give us the framework to actually have a, a a federal recreational model does that seem logical i don't know if the feds need to run a lab they could rely on all the states to say okay. com combined better. That's you better. know i've got like 50 <laughs> different data points right that would be plenty to run right. statistics on and be assured and there's you know a great body of knowledge and effort there to say like hey look and if some state wants to go further than the other state, okay, I think it would be the federal job to say, well, here's the harmonized platform that at mm -hmm. least at the bare minimum, everyone has to do this. And we see that you know, today and then California goes, we gotta go further. Okay, and in some things, thankfully you are going further because maybe that's not quite enough. 
Um, and I think, you know, states' rights and allowing everybody to have that flexibility, that is the system that we all embrace here. And, and I think it can lead towards, hey, here, you know, you guys didn't think this was necessary, but when we took that extra step, we found all of this out. And everyone's like, whoa, maybe we should go take that step too. If you don't give the opportunity for that exploration or that individualized kind of picking, you might not know what you don't know or find out those things that were really important. Um, but I, I think, you know, like one centralized federal lab would be like, I don't know, that'd be like catastrophic. In my yeah, mind. I think you're right. <laughs> like, Let, let's that. keep, let's keep the feds out of it. Yeah. But I think at the but state play, level, I mean, they need to play referee, just like mm -hmm. the states kind of need to play referee on these systems. Like somebody needs to say, Hey, you know, we don't think that's in the best interest of, you know, everyone. Cause if I allowed you to do this stuff unchecked, we know it would go in a direction that causes harm. And, you know, none of us, at least none of us, like are looking to see this is going to cause harm, but you could accidentally do something. Sure. You might inadvertently do something. You might unknowingly do something that without independent verification and checking, you could have a big problem that, you know, causes great public harm, health and safety issue. And, and sure. you know, most of the people, especially that you and I talk to are like, I don't want to have any interest in harming anyone. We're here to help people. We're here to offer physiological tools. We're here to make this, you know, and you know, available to those that have a need to feel better um, in whatever case they want to define that as, whether it's medical, recreational, you know, whatever you want to put on a tax label might be different than what someone is actually seeking. But if you don't check that, I mean, I can assure you, you, you saw it too in the early days when it's a voluntary testing market and there's no regulations, you, know, you have cultivators preemptively spraying pesticides on things. So they're sure they could take it to market. Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't think it hurts anybody. Well, it, it may, it very well may, it's probably not a good idea and you can do it without it. So right. why are you not doing it without it? Um, you know, it forces good practices. It forces good operations and actors. It forces great product quality and kind of level, like raises the quality bar across the playing field and playing that referee in the right fashion, I think is, is only good for all of the patients, consumers, and everyone else there. And the operators can figure it out. It's not, you know, we didn't have thousands of businesses get licensed and then say, I could never sell a product because your regulations are so crazy. I mean, there's things that are difficult, not easy to deal with. And you know, but none of them have proven to be completely impossible. Yeah. So, you know, could things be better? Absolutely. It should be a system that evolves. And I think, you know, we're all understanding it's going to take a little while to keep evolving it to get to a better place, but it's, we're certainly better off than not having any, and we're certainly better off than not having access at all. So sure. and it's I, a balance, right? It's all about equilibrium and balance yeah. and cannabis teaches homeostasis. And, you know, we've got a socioeconomic one um, as much as a physiological one. Yeah, it's it it's a complex issue. I I'm bolstered by the fact that the majority of people want cannabis legalized, including Republicans now. And that's new. There now 51% yeah. of registered Republicans want legalized yeah. cannabis. That's big news. Um and I think I think that as we get better research and data, and now I mean how many states uh, the majority of states have legalized cannabis in some form or another. I mean I thought it's, they it's said Virginia snowballing. Just did it and it was 17 actually yeah. have some form of that now, I think yeah. is the number. Which so once we get up to 25, New York legalizing it, I think is going to be a big tipping point. Yep. Um, Mexico and Canada both being legalized. I wonder if there'll be like a West Coast. <laughs> we're we're booking it. Yeah. Well, yeah. now you have a pipeline on the West Coast from Mexico from Baja <laughs> to British Columbia. Like, yeah, is there yeah. going to be a, a compliant pipeline? I wonder. Right. I you mean, well, yeah. Like when does it become, you know, more free trade? I mean, right. The, the West Farm coast Bill. cannabis free trade Alliance, you know, yeah, something yeah. like that. I mean, that should happen. That, yep. that would be the first step I think towards a federal model to say, Hey, look, we're successfully doing interstate and international mm -hmm. commerce with cannabinoids mm -hmm. and, and no one's died, you know, crimes, right. you know, again, we yeah, have yeah. to go jump through the, all the same hoops every time. Mm -hmm to prove to people that this is legit, um, but really well, interesting the farm stuff. bill should be a good step in that direction, right? The, I mean, the farm bill is, I think we've yeah. kept out the bad guy, but I think we physiologically know, and there's a lot of scientific and medical information that says, hey, THC might not be as bad a guy as you think. Like there are some people that definitely need that type of molecule to have their, you know, rewarding medical effects. So I don't think we can just throw that out and say, ignore it. I mean, there's a place for it, but to regulate it well, because it could be subject to all sorts of other things. And, you know, um, um, I think watching it accordingly. So there's a balance there with it. You can't say none, but you can't say infinite amounts are fine too. 
Um, you know, I, we got to find like, the right balance. And I, think I like the one uh, percent. I like the one percent THC model right now. That's what Europe, the European Union, I think, is, is but, and that's doing what that. on plant and for ingredients, but not for final products. I, I mean, for me, one I mean, percent of a final product that's a lot. That weighs a lot. It's yeah. too much. <laughs> Right. You wouldn't yeah. want that just being sold with no one checking ID and all of a sudden. Sure. You know, yeah. You, you, you could get, old, you could get gets, high off of a 1% you know, 200 product. milligrams of mm-hmm. THC. Yeah. That'd be a problem. But I think for the cultivators, for the hemp farmers that are taking yeah. huge losses because their, sure. their biomass yeah. tests 0.04 mm-hmm. right. and they have to burn their or crop. 0.031, right? right. Because right. the lab just can't do better. I mean, that's right. I agree with you there. I mean, there should be ways of either saying, Hey, since you're over that limit, you can't even move it off your property as you know hemp so why don't you remediate it or mitigate it here and then ship it somewhere else or all right it's all packaged up we can watch this track and traceability to go to a processor who will go ahead and take care of it and make sure that that's not entering the market and we've got all those um, track and traceabilities on those things too so there are definitely ways to manage it and i'm 100 behind you we should not be trying to you know curtail and cripple farmers on especially something that's new to them and new seeds in their new environment and we don't really you know there's got to be a window and margin of error so it's, it's a difficult standard i know i know a lot of the hemp i'm getting for for the hemp products i'm making the farmers are actually harvesting the plants really early to avoid them i, okay. I guess yeah. cbd production maybe happens a little earlier i'm not really sure but i don't think so i think they're pretty similar but it, but it is a safety mechanism right like hey i'm just going to make sure i'm not going over if i let mm-hmm. it go too long i've got more ability to see that happen there the, are- as the plant ripens the yep. cannabinoid profile increases so if you yep harvest it two weeks earlier that seems to be something yeah. they're doing but then they may be sacrificing crop yield and sure. economics and things of that type. so why don't we enable them and i think you know okay we started with some magic number 0.3 i don't think anybody really knows where that came from well, like other Can- than a canadian said, botanist apparently this guy. Yeah, yeah this guy said sure okay mm-hmm. okay good place to start right but now i think we have more data that we should take an intelligent informed decision and say that's probably a little bit too low that, that's asking a lot of the u.s government though to make an intelligent <laughs> and informed decision on drug policy at least. yeah yeah. I, yeah unfortunately I, unfortunately I that right. seems to be true yeah um and so is there such a thing as too many terpenes i mean terpenes are solvents i mean pine sol has yeah, yeah, Pine, yeah. pining in it right yeah. i mean you can yeah. take you, you can have to hurt much, yourself for sure. yeah. you can start to see um irritation you could start to see that they are um you know causing allergic reactions to some folks i mean there is definitely a limit and there are very potent powerful things and when you put multiple ones together they're even more potent so you don't need much of those to actually have a rewarding physiological effect and more is definitely not better mm-hmm. like there is definitely a you know a limit where you're like no i think everyone knows more thc is usually not better too we have a limit where we're like that was a bad experience i, I felt like i didn't want to you know get off the, the bed for a while that's not mm-hmm. okay there is the same thing applying with uh, terpenes. So mm. you don't want, you know, 90% of your product to be terpenes and 10% to be cannabinoids. Right. In the case of, you know, certain types of product types or, or certain terpene combinations. Um, it's hard to say, like, is there not a terpene that you could have 90, 95%? There are, there probably are some that you would, depending on what the product type is and what the terpene is. So I don't want to overgeneralize it, but in, you know, there can be too much of the good thing as well in this. Well, case. it's like essential oils. I mean, essential oils are, are essentially mostly terpenes, yeah. right? Yes, most definitely. Yep. Um, and with essential, I know essential oils are a huge thing right now. And, and there's, there's a lot of snake oil out there and there's a lot of legitimate stuff, but there's a lot of claims being made about essential oils and what they can do. Probably everyone knows someone in their family that's out there hawking, you know, essential oils now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Deuterra or whatever, and you know, crazy expensive. And anyway, um, essential oils have really gotten big, and I think that's great. And that that's a natural product. It's it's made by distilling plant material, from the mm-hmm. way I understand it. Cannabis, you can do the same thing. You can extract the terpenes out of the plant and isolate mm-hmm. those, and then you can pull the cannabinoids out later. There's all types of cool things you can do yep. um, with extraction. Do you have an opinion on cannabis derived terpenes versus synthetic versus natural source? What's your perspective on that? Sure. The cannabis derived ones, while they come from cannabis, they typically do not look like cannabis when you're done, right? So there can be changes in the chemistry of those via the 
um, extraction methodology that's used. So we're having chemical changes and transformations happen. So it's not always a direct representation of what was on the flower. And I think, you know, if we're saying like, hey, we know this flower that as as, as it's been presented to us on the plant has been beneficial and helpful. So that's the best model to say, here's how I can get that into a derivative product, some sort of infused extract or, you know, edible, topical, um, inhalable type of product. The closer I stay to that plant profile, the better I'm going to be in delivering the desired physiological effects and also potentially mitigating toxicological concerns. If I take some derivatized form of that because it changed via all of my extraction techniques and methodologies, am I still as close to the plant as I thought I was, even though I'm labeling it cannabis derived? Maybe not. I mean, in some of the profiles of those, when you go and do an analysis, you're like, I can tell you this is from cannabis, but I wouldn't tell you it is cannabis because it is, you know, only 50% of what's in here do I have a clue about. And since I know I'm looking at a lot of what cannabis has to offer, I should be able to discern more than 50% of this. So there are a lot of changes going on to the molecules throughout that particular process. And there are many types of processes, right? You can have like CO2, you can have distillations, um, hydro distillations, you can have all sorts of ways that people are trying to capture those cannabis derived terpenes. Um, some may be better than other in certain people's opinions, but I think they're their own types of products, right? Did I get it from a consistent cultivated product? Did I do this process in a consistent fashion? And can I reproduce what I gave you? Because if this worked for you this time, can I come back, you know, two weeks later with the next batch and give you the same result? Or did something else change along the way that I couldn't control? And now you don't get that desired physiological result. So that's cannabis derived ones like, you know, natural and synthetic. Those are interesting terms. You know, that's the same molecule. I think it comes down to where did you derive it? Say so if I have 99% limonene and I got it from oranges or I synthesized it in a lab from another starting material, analytically, you see they're both 99% limonene. They're the same molecule molecule is a molecule. So if I think this molecule is good for me, did it matter as much on the way that I got there? Marketing folks surely will tell you it matters much. Um, I think there can sometimes be this perception that naturally derived means it must be in more inherently safe or toxicologically better. But there are lots of natural molecules that we know are not good and not safe, you know, ricin and stuff and sure. even poison ivy and things of that type. So natural isn't always a designator of safe or safety. And it can have natural product variability or really be difficult to control those things. Um, so, you know, I think natural, synthetic, or even cannabis derived, they all will have a good place in the cannabis industry. Every one of those could be useful to someone, it's how consistent can I reproduce exactly what I gave you? And that I think is the standardization challenge. It's not so much where did my source come from, but can I repeatedly derive it from that source and give you that exact same product time and time again? That will help patients, that will help brands become recognizable. Um, and I think it's really more of a push towards standardization than just where did I get it from? Right. I, I hear you on a molecule being a molecule and you know, I, I personally have a preference for at natural plant derived, least processed, you know, that's kind of, mm -hmm. it's what awakened is all about, but you know, from a scientific, purely scientific perspective, the molecule is the molecule. What, what I wonder about sometimes though, is especially with like, say vape pens where a lot of additives are added mm -hmm. and people are adding a lot of terpenes back into the formula for flavor and sometimes effect what I worry about and what seems to be a little bit unexplored is, you know, how, how much is too much? Like you're saying, what if they add mm -hmm. too much of a certain terpene? So what I've always defaulted to in my own manufacturing is, well, nobody's hurt themselves with cannabis yet that we know of not, not, <laughs> right. not in a serious way. Yep. So yep. as long as I keep the terpene levels as close to what the plant produces as possible, which the most terpene profile I've ever seen in a plant is from probably tropical slay ride from green shock that has, I think like 4.8% terpene okay. profile, yep. that one Emerald cup highest terpene profile last year. I've made, I've heard people talk about 5%. Do you know right, what the you know, THC percent was? 28%. Okay. So, so just uh, say like 30 to five, right? Yeah. So 30 to five. 
Yeah. So right. you could just say, here's my ratio. And you're right. If I stay close to that, then that's what the plant produced. And I can move the, the absolute values up and down. As long as those ratios stay the same, then I should be generating, you know, what the plant provided. And I right. think that is mathematically we, reasonable. Right. <laughs> and it seems to be fairly physiologically reasonable. I think, um, I do think that that's a, a, a very intelligent place to start. At least, you know, with the lack of data, Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think, you know, I'm trying to be a conscientious person that's making products that are going to be helpful to people. I wouldn't want to OD them on pinene or limonene or something right. and, and dissolve their stomach lining, you know, right? right. The- I think fortunately it won't go that bad, <laughs> but you would notice it on the tongue or the taste, or you could have, you know, a little bit more of, um, high, you know, irritation, um, of the mouth or airways, um, or even of the stomach, like this doesn't make me feel good. Um, or, you know, people that have like allergic types of reactions. So if you have too much in a topical and your skin's turning red, that's definitely not the desired case either. Right. Right. You know, I was like, even, a you know, tiger balm, right. Which you can buy mm-hmm. at the store. I, you know, I was looking at the formula. I think it's like 24% menthol or something like that. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or right around there, which is I've a used lot. it before, but I never looked at the label when I did. But I mean, that that's a lot of menthol. I mean, that's powerful. Like if mm-hmm. you stick some tiger balm in your eye, you're probably going to be going to the ER. You're not going to have know. a good time. No, that's <laughs> not, that is not okay. So like, yeah. like you said, just because something's natural doesn't mean it, it can't be harmful. I think it's, it's yeah. important for people to, to realize that. Um, and to manufacturers using these things, you know, when you have highly concentrated, it, you know, ingredients like that, that you're then going to dilute further. You know, I think there's a little bit of like, hey, this safety data sheet, this SDS sheet says that this has all these hazards. Well, that's in the very potent, neat form and how you're supposed to safely handle it to put it in the product. Right. That's not the end safety data sheet of the final product. That's of the ingredient. So mm-hmm. 100% menthol, right, that I use to make my Tiger Bomb, that might have a rather scary safety data sheet. But when I dilute it down into the Tiger Bomb, it's fine, provided mm-hmm. you don't stick it in your eye. Right. So, right. you know, it is how do I use it? Where am I using it? What's the concentration of that final product and what I'm using it in? But to any manufacturers or people playing with neat terpenes at home, I mean, they're very different than when you're diluting them down into a product. Concentration has a huge impact on that thing. Here, and um, it's making me... There's, there's so many questions I want to ask you, Jeff. I just have like a, a personal question I really want to know. Sure, so sure. Obviously, obviously terpenes and essential oils are, are, are used in flavoring and fragrances in the flavoring and fragrance industry. You know, we, we find terpenes in all kinds of products we're probably not even aware of. Is there a standard for like, there has to be a manufacturing standard somewhere that the Clorox Corporation refers to, to say, hey, we want to make sure we're not putting more linalool or pinein than this amount is there some type of standardized i don't know if they're regulated or standardized to that fashion i mean i think you know the clorox company will say here's the product that we've gone through all of our studies and Mm -hmm. we know it very well our marketing group has said this is effective one economically i don't want to put more in there that is effect than effective because that's just not going to be cost effective to the company so there's a little inherent economical protection in that um but it is really product specific right so like you're saying like with tiger bomb you can say like you know, 24% menthol in there was very effective, but if I have 24% menthol in a cigarette, that right. very well may not be a good right. idea. Right. So it's it's really, really difficult to say, hey, I saw this over there, therefore it must be okay over here. And mm-hmm. I think that's exactly the vitamin E acetate problem, right? So we were like, hey, this is fine. And it's generally recognized as safe as a topical, right? Mm-hmm. Not in an, a vape product and not to inhale because other it was never studied that way and things might happen like we saw happen so it's really a product specific designation and that's you know unfortunately as complicated as it could get because we could say hey i I saw this one molecule and i know it's infinitely good no matter what we do Mm -hmm. um but that's unfortunately not the case it really is very very product specific well it's like anything i mean gasoline when you put it in your engine is really great (laughs) but you wouldn't want to drink it i mean yeah um and uh maybe good Maybe that's too obvious of an example, but I mean, I think there's some truth to that and, and people need to recognize how powerful some of these chemicals are, especially concentrated. And that's why the vape thing, you know, I've never been a huge fan of vape pens. I, I use them when I travel because they're convenient, but I've always been more of a flower guy. Um, but I think, I think vape pens have a huge future and potential because they're convenient. They're mm-hmm. potent. Yep. They're relatively easy to manufacture. Um, 
there's a lot and of you people can doing standardize that. them and make them consistent i think mm -hmm. when you do it well so i think that does have a lot to offer you know in terms of a physiological tool too and and i th you know and people like them you know and and so for the people that you know are listening to this that you know either use vapes currently or thinking about using cannabis vapes thc or cbd vapes um you mentioned vitamin e acetate and so can you explain a little bit about that? Because that's that's the vape gate crisis sure. that mean, happened that, a couple of yeah. years ago. Yep, that was the one predominantly responsible for the Evali problem. I don't know if it's the only thing. You know, it wasn't in every single case that they found. Why were um, people using vitamin E acetate? What was the purpose of adding that to the formula? So as I under we I'd never used it myself, so I don't know. You know, and I never talked to those that have used it directly. But as I understand it, it was more because of lack of testing of THC potency. So mm -hmm. if I had a vape cart and I saw a bubble, you know, and I flipped the vape card over, how long did it take for the bubble to go up to the, you know, to go back to the other side? If it goes really fast, it means I, I must have cut down the THC concentration so that it was, you know, thinned out and, you know, more cost effective for the hmm. illicit manufacturer. Okay. This wasn't happening in places where it's tested because if I went to the testing lab with a 30% THC thing and called it 80%, they'd say, no, it's not. And it's not allowed to go out and it wouldn't be labeled under 80. But in an illicit market where there's no testing and there's, you know, no labeling, I'm going strictly by this visual test. And if I can fake it to someone that my stuff's very viscous, I think it was understood that THC distillate oil and concentrates are very viscous. So higher concentrations mean that bubble turns over slower. Mm -hmm. Then you wanted something that did that. And they said, well, what's super cheap and what could give me these types of thickening effects that I can add this to the vape cart and, you know, they didn't approach it from the standardization standpoint. They approached it from the, how do I visibly make it look like this is high potency THC? So I want something that, you know, will flow enough to get in the cartridge, but is thick enough that it passes the bubble test. Gotcha. Um, and that unfortunately was, I, I think the large driver for how this could be useful in that respect. But it was, the reason is um, when you heat a molecule like that, it degrades into another molecule that's highly reactive and was causing all the problems in the lungs. Right. Um, I think right. we, we now know that, unfortunately, right. um, um, which is probably hard to predict until you would do, say, toxicology studies or understand things like that. Um, we now know that molecules like that, that have that you know, phenolic acetate function are bad. Um, and I, I really worry that I'm starting to see like THC acetate show up and other um, cannabinoid acetates where that same problem can happen. So, you know, I, I, I'm fearful that we may inadvertently even go down that path again without uh, being a vape excipient or anything um, being used like in the same fashion. We're just going to make a molecule that we think is going to be more psychoactive or interesting and cause that problem. Hmm. Um, what is it starts to become complex chemistry, so I don't want to like, right. flip you're, everyone out there, but that's... Um, you're, yeah. talk, you're talking <laughs> so, about things that I've never the, heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. What the is easy THC way to think acetate? Of that is, um, so it's um, adding a small polar group to THC that allows it to pass the blood brain barrier better. Hmm. So it's a very like inexpensive and relatively simple chemical transformation to perform. So if I have a lot of these things around somebody with, you know, enough rudimentary college level cannabis or chemistry knowledge is going to say, Hey, you could do this. And here's how you could make this potentially more psychoactive, um, which is, not necessarily the case. And I don't think it's needed in this case either. We've got plenty of the right molecule. Don't go mess with it. Um, but that, if you heat it, is going to cause the same things that we saw with vitamin E acetate. And if you're dabbing it or vaporizing it or putting it in combustion products, you could see these same problems. Um, and then we'll have an even bigger you know, regulatory problem. So I really caution anyone that would understand that to not do it. I think the inadvertent repercussions of it could be far greater than we'd ever anticipate or want to see. And this is different than nanotechnology, mm -hmm. which is also uh, yeah, supposed to yeah. increase the bioavailability. So that's like just like encapsulating or capturing the THC molecules in really small particles. And mm -hmm. those particles are in such a way that it, it's delivered easier to the receptors of interest to the body. Um, and not all nano claims are actually accurate. It does right. depend on how you've gotten there and does it stay that way or do they agglomerate after you've formed it? Um, there's a lot of really complex things that go on with the nano pieces too. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, you know, the, the, the market is always going to try to find 
cheaper ways to get people higher, right? Unfortunately, and, yes. And there, and there might be some really negative um, potential consequences of that. I know as a topical maker, you know, when the vape gate thing was happening around vitamin E, suddenly everyone, I have vitamin E in my <laughs> topical as a preservative, which I think all yep. topicals should have some Makes a lot preservative. Of sense. Yeah. It. Uh, it's a natural one. It's a very good one. And people were flagging that, you know, on COAs going, Hey, you know, what, what, why you does have this have vitamin E in it? I didn't tell you to inhale it. It's <laughs> right. fine in this but, fashion. But I, I had to go and literally talk to all of my accounts and educate them on why our topicals have vitamin E, how it's, yes, it's the same thing they're using to cut the vape pens, but if you don't smoke it, it's actually really good for you. It's when yep. you inhale it, that it becomes harmful. Yep. Um, so interesting stuff. Do you have a favorite terpene? I joke that they're like all my children. I don't have a favorite. I'm not allowed to. Um, no, I, I probably don't have one particular favorite. I do like the smell of lavender. I do like the smell of linalool. I think that's a pretty you know solid front runner for me. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily my favorite. Um, but I, I do like that one. Lin I love lavender too. Um, lin lavender, the plant would have linalool along with what other terpenes? Limonene, pinene, myrcene. What else? Is Lots of other ones for sure. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. So it's not just linalool, but no. that's kind of the dominant. Yeah, yeah. And and then we have pure linalool that you can smell. Right. And, you know, that and is it's still it's still pleasant. It doesn't smell like the lavender plant, but it is still. And they've pleasant. they've done clinical trials on linalool, right? Haven't they? Uh, on a on a standardized extract of lavender. Yes. Right. On, yep, there's products in the European market that are, are good for, for that. treating uh, depression or anxiety or, or I something. Think I think that's what it yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And they compared it to an antidepressant at work just as well or better um i don't know if they did a head-to-head -head trial with another pharmaceutical but they did it against the placebo for okay. um, if i'm remembering correctly gotcha yeah so and it did show some clinical efficacy like hey this right. can really help you in that so example. for anybody listening to lavender you know next time you see it your neighbor's probably growing it you know and you, next time you're <laughs> yeah, walking your dog your go, face in there go stick your face in there it'll yeah. chill you out and calm feel you down. a little better <laughs> yeah. the plant is speaking to you it's telling you to chill out that's fine. <laughs> It'll be fine. Just come on over here. Um, do you like cannabis? Do you, you are you a smoker, Jeff? I'm sure I am a cannabis consumer. Yes. Do you do you like vapes, flower, concentrates? What what's your jam? Um, I've tried them all. I think there's you know a place and time for each and, and one of, of every one of them. Um, I am a vape user. I think those are, are very convenient and very effective. Um, but I do still like the flower uh and it in its form as well. So I'm a do fan you like, of that. Do you like distillate vapes or live resin or uh is there I can't say I've had too many live resin vapes, but I, I am a fan of the distillate vapes. Well formulated ones can be very, very effective um yep. from both a taste and physiological standpoint. So yep. and not all distillate is created equal. I mean you can no, no. you can have no, a no. wide variety of quality yeah, um, with with distillate. And distillate is essentially distilled cannabinoids. Yep. Yep. And to take that as so you've removed the terpenes from distillate, mm -hmm. and then they're added back into the formula later, either Correct. cannabis derived or some type of or otherwise. Yeah. Or otherwise yep. botanical derived. I think is what they say. Botanical I, terpenes covers right. the synthetic and natural versions both. Right. And I know you, I know you're really big on the true to plant um, aspect of this. Like how, is there a way to actually, um, like if you, if you, if you, if I analyze this bud for the terpene profile and then I smoke it, is there a way to analyze the smoke or like what, how do we know that what there, we're there smoking are, is actually It's a received? lot harder because there's a whole lot more molecules in that. Um, so it becomes a lot, lot more complex, but there are ways of doing that. And I think that's what everyone's starting to do in the, the vape um vape world if you will that they are saying hey here's what i put in this hardware device but what did i get out of it because that's what i'm actually being exposed to um so the the analytical push in that direction is increasing and i think we'll see more and more labs be able to do that which will definitely be a very good thing so the entourage effect that you kind of mentioned briefly is going to be the interplay between the cannabinoids and the terpenes is that uh, yeah, yeah. I that, mean, there may be many other it. things involved too, right? It's just like this plethora of molecules. It's not one, it's not two, it's kind of all of them together. Um, I would never want to say it's only five or only 10. Like, I don't think you know, and it may be a very different number depending on the molecules and depending upon, um, you know, which 
product form and which person you're talking right. about. Right. And I probably know your answer to this because you're a nuanced scientist and nothing is ever black and white with any scientist. <laughs> but I know that people are going to want to know like, hey, I'm in pain. What terpenes should I look for? I want to sleep at night. What what strain of cannabis should I look for? Can you give people any indicators of what terpene profiles they should look for, for the big ones, anxiety, sleep, and pain? It's really tough. Um, I think that's really tough to kind of say like which ones are right. Cause it's not one terpene. It's kind of the, you know, the number of those that you see. So try and get as much information on a C of A or from the product manufacturer about what the top three to five terpenes might be so that you can understand, you know, Hey, this is, this is what I'm looking for because I tried this and I tried that. So ask, it, you're going to do a little trial and error, ask, you know, someone, Hey, what is on either end of the spectrum? And maybe what do you see is in the middle? And then I can look at those things and say, well, this one's high in terpenaline. This one's high in, you know, pinenes and um, myrcene. This one's high in linalool. This one's kind of got a sum of both. Like maybe I should try the one over here that's, you know, devoid of terpenaline because those always made me feel going uplifting in that direction. Mm. Um, I think it's, it's too early for us to kind of say like, Hey, these top three are always going to be your recommendation. It's very individualized. Right. Um, and I, I, I do think you, you can do it in relatively short order now, like before it was, we called it whatever indica sativa. And that wasn't always as helpful as it needed to be because it was often mislabeled as indica to just sell it some more. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And indicas at least in SoCal command a higher price point. So if you're a grower, you might just call, something in indica because you know you're going to get a little bit more for it but it doesn't speak to its actual yep. uh, medicinal properties um well I, unfortunately i think we're kind of coming to a close here um okay but uh, uh but it's been really been i'm happy great. to come back <laughs> yeah I, I will definitely yeah, bring yeah. you back because you're way too valuable um to this industry and and it, you know you've been uh, a good ally to mine all these years and and I, I just think you have a fascinating brain and um for people <laughs> that you. don't know jeff you know he's he's a phd chemist um usc grad he's run the workshop one of the largest manufacturing operations in california he's an expert on terpenes you have a terpene company mm -hmm. um yep. still if you want yeah. you want to plug yep. your terpene no, no, company, we sell them through the workshop brand you can go to the workshop.com t-h-e-w-e-r-c-s-h-o-p um, and reach out through us through there. And um, we're on social media channels for that too. And we'd and be happy to speak about product formulations, ingredients, and things that you would need. Amazing. Yeah, these guys really know their stuff. And um, your brother um, really knows his stuff too. I'll have to get him on here as well. <laughs> yeah. He can smoke cigarettes yeah. the whole time. <laughs> you better not. <laughs> I'm trying to, I think, uh, I think he's mitigated that to a great okay, extent. Good. But, um, Maybe you know, a, with the different stress levels, it right. seems to be a, a problem. So Maybe there's a um, terpene that helps with that. I'm sure there is. I'm, I'm still trying to find that one. <laughs> they say um, a heavy dose I'm, of CBD it has shown yeah. some positive effects I, I do think you know some potential hemp cigarette replacement yeah. rules well that that's what i'm smoking this is actually this is actually hemp and okay i it's sometimes if i smoke too many i get a little sleepy but i really enjoy smoking hemp and some of this hemp is getting really terpene rich like this stuff yep. is from oregon it's 15 percent cbd really two, two percent terpene profile which yep. even a couple of years ago is like man you're lucky to get one percent terpene profile on a hemp cultivar yep. Yep. Um, so the hemp growers are really advancing that cause right now. And that's some exciting well, You can see stuff. someone in the bag, you're like, I would have never called that hemp, you know, mm -hmm. years ago, you would like undoubtedly know just by visual looks, but today this it's is, very yeah. different. This is Indian hemp. This is some old school. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> nice. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Raber. Great to have you on Headspace. I'll uh, definitely be bringing you back as a regular guest. I'm sure people are going to really get a lot out of that and uh, have a great day. And I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Levi. You have a great one as well. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strong. Be sure and join us next week for another episode. And until then, peace.